This is pretty much pop, a culture podcast, perpetually one victory point shy of wrapping this bastard up. Today we're discussing board games, both their childhood entry varieties, as well as the more geeky adult activity. I'm Mark Linsenmeyer, sitting right behind the lake, but surrounded by bombs, so just bring out your eights. Let's go through our panel today. I'm Michelle Paranello Kaysen. I have a background in rhetoric studies. I teach online classes for the secular, eclectic, academic homeschooling community. I'm the founder of Dela Learning, the co-founder of C Online Classes, and I'm here today because I have become a huge board game fan, particularly over the course of the pandemic. And I also use board games in game schooling, which is a methodology of using board games to teach to my own, I homeschool my own kids. So I use them a lot as a form of curriculum. So that's sort of why I'm here. Yes, you are why we are doing this topic that we had a, a conversation earlier and you convinced me this was a good idea, but it was sort of something along these lines was, you know, we did Dungeons and Dragons, freaking we should do board games at some point. Tommy, reintroduce yourself. Long time listeners of my products will know your voice. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Tommy Moranges. I'm the co-creator of a game called Secret Hitler and my more recent game is called Inhuman Conditions. Before that, I wrote an internet blog called Philosophy Bro. And you're so concerned about your anonymity that you even lied to us about your actual name so we couldn't slip up and call you the wrong thing. That's right. That was back when I was still applying to grad school and I wasn't sure how professors would feel about that internet blog. The good news is I didn't get into grad school and so now my life is way better. (laughs) And uh, returning for the second time in recent past, I'm Al from Leeds in the UK. And I am currently managing editor of a, an online space and organization called Logically, and we deal with counter misinformation work in a lot of different ways. But when I was a philosophy grad student, I did some work on the philosophy of games, and I guess that's kind of why I'm here. And I'm also just a big nerd. Yes. My only qualification is, is I've just played a lot of these things, and I went to Gen Con once. It seemed a lot. <laughs> I think I ran into you in the hallway that one time you were at Gen Con. Oh, yes, that's right. That's amazing that that was the one time you were there. (laughs) Because that was my first Gen Con ever. So I was like, oh, wow, someone else from my other life out in the wild. So I I phrase this all to you as we're doing board game ideology. And there was an article about the board games that ask you to reenact colonialism and got me thinking about Puerto Rico one of the objectively best board games in terms of like sort of entry level, but like adults, lots of victory points, multiple ways to win. Too complicated for about half of my family to want to stand. But yet it now makes me feel a little grimy and I understand things like that are being reskinned. Michelle, you were coming at this from more the, the kids angle, but for some reason what you were putting forward seemed to synergize with this article that I had just read. Can you kind of launch us off here? Yeah, I mean, I think that board games in particular have gotten a lot more, it has just gotten to a larger audience. So the questions that are being asked about what messages they're sending and reading them as a rhetorical form and considering the way that they are operating in the world has just gotten a larger audience with different perspectives than it has traditionally had. And we have better platforms for voicing those concerns. I'm sure that you know, 20 years ago, if you had showed somebody Puerto Rico, there were plenty of people who would have been like, oh, wait, this is a problem. But now they have platforms where they can be heard about those problems. And it's just making us question a lot of assumptions we have about, oh, well, it's just you put it on cardboard. So it is kind of innocuous. And what harm can it do? And that article that you're talking about from The Atlantic had a good, I'm paraphrasing here, but a line in it that was like, the mechanics of a game necessitate you taking on its perspective in a way that maybe a movie or a book doesn't necessarily do. Because you can't play it if you aren't accepting at least some of the perspective that the game makers have put you in because you are an active participant in a way you aren't necessarily for other kinds of media. I think that take is wrong in a super interesting way. I'm going to be the asshole who takes the first easy example and talks about Monopoly and the original conception of Monopoly as opposed to how it's kind of developed. And it's a really good place to start a discussion like this because the original designer of Monopoly intended it to function as a a satire of capitalism. So here is an example like which speaks exactly to the idea that you guys were just talking about. If whether by playing Monopoly, you're buying into the the mindset of the capitalist exploitative landlord ideology, or whether there is a way to 
engage with that perspective without necessarily approving of it. So if there's a way that you can kind of engage with that perspective, but maintain a satirical edge on it. And I think that plays out in a lot of current games. And a lot of the ways that games can be satirical involve doing exactly that, like playing with mechanics which seem to express a, like usually a caricatured version of a particular ideology, but making fun of it in some other way. So Munchkin is an excellent example of that, right? It uses a lot of the same mechanics as like Poe-faced dungeon crawling games, but the way that it uses some of those mechanics and the way that it paints over those mechanics with its, you know, funny names and graphics and everything gives you a way of engaging with potentially problematic gameplay elements and mechanics while showing you how ridiculous they are. So I have two thoughts here, but let me start with like Monopoly. So the Landlord's game originally came with two versions. There was the version that we know as Monopoly, and then you turned the board over, and on the back was a game that you played that demonstrated what could happen when we played cooperatively. And it was just that first game that was about how things are under like land use capitalism that became Monopoly. So it was originally intended as a satire, but it's not like in its current form, it was the complete satire. In fact, the elements that made clear what was weird and bad about capitalism, those were explicitly removed. We just play the game that's a replication of capitalism. And Monopoly is a great example because Monopoly is miserable to play. It's an amazing (laughs) game in the sense that it exactly models the experience it's trying to model, which is under capitalism... Everybody has a bad time and not a regular bad time, a long, grinding, (laughs) slow, bad time, except for one guy who gets to have so much fun. Also, the thing about Monopoly, you've unfortunately activated one of my trap cards, Al, is whether accidentally or on purpose, the most powerful spots on the Monopoly board are the oranges because they're best positioned to benefit from the carceral system of jail. Players get sent to jail and then, oh, they're six to eight sweet, sweet steps away from those oranges. So I don't know that Monopoly is an example that shows that. I actually think Monopoly shows the ways that board games can just replicate existing dynamics and any intended satire can get lost if we're not careful. I mean, I can imagine a society where we play Puerto Rico and everyone like understands it as a history lesson and it's a way of showing like the economics of slavery can be very good if you are willing to overlook what exactly the costs, right? If you're willing to treat other costs as externalities, I'm doing air quotes to show that I'm, and I realize that's not going to come across an audio. Uh, slavery is bad, but you can also imagine someone playing Puerto Rico in like a pacifist way as like sort of role playing it and always losing, but being like, yeah, I did worse, but I didn't do slavery. And I think that most people who play Puerto Rico now would not be psyched to play with that person, right? Like the game does not reward that. No one would be like, wow, good point, man. I really like bringing up Monopoly as the example, because I think the fact that, you know, you used to flip it over and play it again, makes it a really didactic design, right? Like that it was this multifaceted, layered, you know, we're going to teach you a lesson one way, and then we're going to flip it and teach you the same, like apply what you just learned in this different environment. And how simplified the version that became so popular is, is just, it's just kind of fascinating to me how that happened. And then you think about the way that it got put out into pop culture as like, you know, the Monopoly game on the McDonald's cups and the, all these versions of the Monopoly game for all these, you know, like here's a Star Wars version, here's a Cats version, here's a polka dot version, like all these different things that have gotten so far from that message of what lessons could you learn about capitalism. And A ton of the people I know personally who have Monopoly have never even finished a full game. Like that it's, it's literally just like the game you have to have on your shelf to point to, to be like, yes, I have board games. I don't even know that most of the people who buy it intend to play it or they get halfway through the first game and someone flips a table or someone is like, oh my goodness, can we please stop doing this now? And then it just ends. So I think as far as like a, is this a fun game to play? (laughs) We can't, I don't know. It's just interesting to me because. I think that we think of games like Monopoly or Sorry or those kind of traditional, like the ones that everybody has on their from their grandma's bookshelves when they were growing up. And those are the first things that come to mind. But their mechanics are often sort of oversimplified and kind of have gotten sanitized in, in a way that these games that like board game players play in Puerto Rico or even, you know, Catan, those have those mechanics stay in place a little more than some of those more popular games. I think Monopoly 
is a great example of the principle that like there's nothing capitalism won't sell back to you. Yes. <laughs> so Michelle, you brought up sorry, which I, you know, brilliantly simple design and the ideology is all in the name is to teach young children to be little snots to each other. Sorry, not sorry. Ah, ha, ha. Like, do you remember the commercials? It was like, get to be cruel to your siblings, but it's part of a game, so it's fine. Yeah. (laughs) That is some brilliant, low-budget, purely idea marketing. It's not, you're bringing up all the sort of different flavors of Monopoly, and there's all these flavors of Munchkin, like like Al brought up, that you could have, even though it's supposed to be like a Dungeons & Dragons sort of game, it seems like it would defeat the purpose if you put like, what, Monty Python cards in it or something like that. But I think that's one of the flavors, unless I'm misremembering. There's a bunch. Maybe I'm confusing with Flux. But I'm wondering how much it matters. It is a positive boon for some reason. Like the art style matters quite a bit, but it doesn't necessarily have to match up with the gameplay. So Sushi Go is one my family has been playing. Like I have no connection to sushi itself. I don't even like sushi. I didn't think I would like the game because I didn't like sushi. And there's nothing specifically about like, the kind of food that like, oh, if two of you try to eat this food at the same time, then neither of you gets any points. Like there's no logic to it whatsoever other than like we're putting together kind of a meal for you. So it's just very rough and just relies on the fact that it's just cute art. And that's all there is to the ideology of it. Tommy, as game designer, it seems like you put a lot of effort in the aesthetics, the visual look of it. Like that's definitely important. But it is very much tied to the gameplay, to the ideology of sort of player versus player interaction or whatever. Is there a kind of, Mark and I are both failed songwriters, so I would wonder if there's a, and one question that you get asked a lot as a songwriter is like, do the lyrics come first or does the music come first? And so, and it strikes me as an analogous question you could ask to a game designer, which is, does the setting come first? And then you come up with the mechanics to express something about the setting or do the mechanics come first and you find a suitable setting to express what you think is important about the mechanics. I think that's a really good revealing analogy. I never thought of it that way, but I suspect as with songwriting, you will find writers and designers who take either approach. There are the red hot chili peppers of board game design who obviously started with one thing. I, for example, both of my games started with the theme and then were attempts to model the interesting relevant aspects of that Right, Secret Hitler is, it's a social deduction game, so it's like descended from werewolf, where you have hidden traitors, and we started with the idea that there was a time in history this happened, and this is a sort of inherently political genre, a well-coordinated minority versus like a very confused majority, and a lot of the other themes around that have been sort of kind of milquetoast or vague, but like, what if we tried to actually model what happened here? So we put out a print and play. And lots of people are uncomfortable with the theme, and that makes a lot of sense. I would never tell someone they should be comfortable with the theme of the Hitler game. But lots of people have reskinned the game to be about either Harry Potter, there's a lot of like secret Voldemort reskins, or Emperor Palpatine, there's a lot of secret Sith, both of whom are other literary analogs for Hitler, which makes me feel really good that like we captured something true there. But yeah, I mean, the answer to your question, like, there are some people where there's a, I mean, there's a very well-regarded Euro game about running a post office. And I just, I can't imagine being like, let me start there. But maybe I just, the blue cubes are Catholicism. It is not a a style of design I identify with. I was thinking about, as, as you were describing that, this is not a board game, but I create live hosted virtual escape rooms as one of the classes that I offer to homeschoolers. And I'm mostly targeting like, you know, the 10 to 14 year old range. So they're not quite as robust as the ones that I played some as a a player online. But for those, it's definitely the mechanics first, right? Like I'm, I'm coming up with what puzzles would be fun. And then I'm like, okay, what setting can I then plug those into that's going to make some logical sense as we move through them? Like if I had this color coded puzzle, well, if there's a kitchen, then I can make it attached to these cups, you know, like, so I think in the, in that case, I'm definitely considering the puzzle mechanics before I start to figure out like what setting is it in. But I'm now trying to like mentally go through the list of games and be like, I wonder which one started with the theme and which one started with the mechanics. And if you can tell or not, might reveal something about those games. Like it's probably epicyclical too, right? Like even within a game, like a game that started with like pure theme, like I remember we tried to have a jail mechanic and it just like didn't work. And so we had to back it. We came up with a different mechanic and then we had to back out and be like, what is this model? 
here. So at different levels, right, you sort of move back and forth between those two, probably also with songwriting. Michelle mentioned something about fun, and I think that's important too, because if like if when you're designing your mechanics, your principal aim is to make them fun or to make them result in fun, if that's where you go into it trying to design, it seems like you might come out with like something different than if you're trying to go into it finding mechanics to express an idea. So you read a lot about game designers speaking in terms of mechanics, expressing ideas. In your view, how much of that is legit? And how much do people actually just approach mechanics from a position of like playability and fun and think about mechanical expression of ideas afterwards? So many of the game designers that I know who are mostly older than me, sort of old guard mentors of mine, my friend Luke and I do a panel called Fun is a Four-Letter Word. Lots of game designers actually don't like discussing the idea of fun, and they think that that probably should not enter your design process because it's a sort of ineffable thing that you can't quite put your finger on, and it's hard to define. And also, like, almost anything, like, someone will find almost anything fun. Almost anything you make, there's some audience, and it's never been easier to, like, find the thousand people you need to sell your game to to make it viable. So coming up with a satisfying expression of almost any experience probably generates fun anyway. Like a Euro game about running a post office, like who would have thunk? But if it's a satisfying expression of that, that elides the worst parts of it and manages to bring out what's interesting to the designer, probably other people will find that interesting too. Yeah. The thing that came to mind as you were describing that is mostly the games that I've tried to incorporate into game schooling as a homeschooling parent, right? And it's really clear when the game was entirely like, we have this lesson to teach and we are going to try to gamify it so that kids will play it and parents will buy it. And it just has no elements of like fun or joy or playability in it because it was made by curriculum designers. Like you can tell that they just tried to kind of reverse engineer some game mechanics to get to a particular goal. And most importantly, the kids can tell, right? The kids are like, this is not a game. Like you just, you're, you're tricking me. And so that's what came to mind when I was thinking of fun. But I completely agree with you. Like one of my favorite games that I play, I play it on Board Game Arena that is like my like, oh, I really need to relax. It's been a long day. It's called Welcome To. And you're literally just putting number. It's a roll and write game. Like you're literally just putting numbers on a, a board because you're a, like a real estate developer is the theoretical mechanics behind it. And if somebody just described that game to me, I never would have picked it up. But it just happened to like come up in the board game. Arena. And I'm like, this is the most relaxing like way to chill out at the end of the day. And so, yeah, I think there is an audience for just about everything. If it is an actual game. I do think some of the games are not really games and have kind of been dolled up that way. We've got a lot of sponsors today. Let's get to it. If you're on a mission to be the best gift giver ever this year, it's never too early to start crossing off your list. Whether you're shopping for mom, dad, teenagers, in-laws, or your best friends, Uncommon Goods makes it easy to find remarkable and truly original gifts for anyone. Uncommon Good wants your holiday season to be stress-free, so check out their selection of thousands of items today. Maybe a candle holder shaped like a homemade wooden house or a handmade felt menorah. There are like over a hundred holiday specific things like that and cool stuff in many categories. Jewelry, kitchen and bar, crafts, clothes, bags, tech and electronics. You could get your loved one or yourself a Bluetooth banana phone, a moving beer pong robot, a personalized moon and stars nightlight, dinosaur taco holders. Are you detecting a theme here? Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and very often handmade or made in the U.S. They have the most meaningful, out of the ordinary gifts anywhere. Who knows what holiday shopping will look like this season and the unique gifts that Uncommon Goods can sell out fast. So shop now, get it taken care of early. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 back to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $2.5 million to date. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash PMP. That's uncommongoods.com slash PMP for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer, Uncommon Goods. We're all out of the ordinary. When you decide you need to see a doctor, you probably need to see a doctor now. Not in a few days, a few weeks, definitely not in a few months. And if you need to see an MD ASAP, we've got a solution. Just download the free ZocDoc app. 
the easiest way to find a great doctor and instantly book an appointment. I've just been looking at their website. It is a great search interface. Put in your zip code, when you'd ideally like the appointment to be, what the condition or procedure or doctor type is, choose your insurance plan. It'll immediately give you a list of local doctors who take your insurance with the appointment times available right there. You can go ahead right in the app, book an appointment for an in-person or maybe a video chat. So no more waiting on hold with a receptionist. Whether you need a primary care physician, dentist, dermatologist, psychiatrist, eye doctor, or other specialist, ZocDoc has you covered. And it's got verified patient reviews for each search result. Millions of people use ZocDoc every month. I'm definitely going to use this the next time I need to see a doctor because ZocDoc makes healthcare easy. Now is the time to prioritize your health. Go to ZocDoc.com slash PMP and download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free and book a top-rated doctor. Many are available as soon as today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash PMP. So one game that occurs to me that like absolutely had to go from mechanic to theme is code names. How familiar are you with code names? Give a little description for folks that don't know what that is. Code names is at the is sort of the founding game of a genre that I call empathy games. There might be other terms for it, but it's a game where you have to communicate. You have a, a five by five grid of words, and you have to communicate to a partner which of these twenty five words belong to you as a team. So you have a key in front of you, like a little guide that tells you the positions of the words. The thing about this game is you have to give a one word clue that captures usually two to three of these 25 words and avoids other words. You might say animal if you have both bear and dragon, but if dragon is a word that belongs to the other team, you have to find a different way to signal bear. The premise of the theme is you are trying to make contact with your team's spies without making contact with any enemy agents, which does not seem to actually be that. Like, there are lots of other ways you could do this. It could have been a totally themeless game, right? It could have just been, like, word say. But it's hard for me to imagine that game coming out of the theme, though I suppose I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Well, I was associating the theme and the design as being sort of one and the same, because of course the theme naturally suggests the design, but like the thing with the sushi game might suggest that it is often the design can sort of really make or break the gameplay. It's exactly the same freaking thing, but like you will not invest yourself or, you know, I started playing Munchkin with my mother-in-law and as soon as she got the idea of what the flavor was, she was out because a fake D and D game was like going to be a disqualifier for her. Whereas I am like, uh, regular playing cards, that means nothing to me. I need a dragon on the card, you know, so, something to catch my imagination. Tommy, you said something really interesting. And it sounds like, you know, the games that you design are these social games where who you're playing with matters so much, right? And so when we were talking about sort of the ideology of board games and, you know, the Atlantic article is talking about sort of this collective ideology, like what message is it sending out into the public? How are we interpreting that? What meaning does it have in this broader sense? But I'm really interested in how does it place pressures on the relationship between the players. And I think that board games run a real gamut, even within, like, you can't even separate it between, like, this is a cooperative game versus this is a competitive game. Even within there, those mix and match, just by how much does the other person's personality and decision-making skills impact my gameplay. And I've really noticed that I choose games from like different quadrants of that, depending on my mood and how much mental energy I have to put into it. And I think that I'm most fascinated by games that have like a real high stake, right? Where it's like who you play this with completely changes the game. But I think that it's maybe even harder. I don't know if it's harder to create a game where it doesn't change it or not. As I started to say that, I'm like, that might not be true. But I think that that dynamic is really interesting. It's one of the things that I always look for in a really good board game is that when you play it, you feel like you understand the friends that you're playing with it a little bit better. When I was in grad school, one of our favorite activities was to try and get together, was to try and play the Game of Thrones board game, like from start to end, which is a phenomenally designed game, like from carpet to rafters. But one of my favorite things about it was it did such a good job of putting you in the position where you have to make these very desperate, resource-driven, cutthroat political decisions 
your friends who didn't want to make any enemies at the table, they just got stomped immediately. It was such a good game at bringing out the ruthlessness in, in people who you previously, you know, admired morally. Even though there is this exciting, more recent genre of games, which kind of just takes the social relationships between the players as its raw material. That's something which I think does cut through a lot of deep strategy games, whether they're competitive or not. Yeah, I I was thinking about my spouse and I, we played through all three of the pandemic legacies over the past 18 months-ish. And so we... Hell yeah. Yeah, like it. It was a really intense experience because we just played it, just the two of us. For anybody who doesn't know, a legacy game, I assume all of you know, but if anybody listening doesn't know, a legacy game, you change the game as you play it, right? So like you'll rip up cards, you write on the board, and you can only really play it through once, but it takes multiple plays. So it took us like, you know, probably six weeks to play through all of them, all of the individual games within a season of this game. So the decisions that you make have much more the stakes are a lot higher because it's going to permanently change the game. So the decision you make now might keep you from being able to do something later or might put you on a path that's going to change it. And the pandemic legacy games, you're trying to save the world from these different pandemics that are outbreaking. And there's all these times when you have to like choose to save each other versus choosing to continue to try to reach the goal of that month or you know, are you going to make this person sacrifice their character or are you going to go and rescue them? But then does that mean that together we're collectively going to fail this goal? And it was just a really, um, I really enjoyed it, but it was a very intense social experience. And I think it would have stressed me out to play with somebody that I didn't know well. Like, I think it would have been a really high stress situation. Is this one of the reasons why, Tommy, you were saying that you don't want to talk just about fun in general, because there are such a distinct personality types of gamers you should be more specific than fun because there's maybe not going to be a fun for everybody or or that's going to be a very limited sort of game that I kind of prefer the, I'm building stuff over here. Maybe we interact a little bit because we have to compete for a few resources. But for the most part, it's kind of me maximizing my resources. Agricola is, is one, of them, one of these. And just trying to get to the victory point level and the amount of actual conflict is minimal. What it sounds like what Al was just voicing was exactly the opposite. And yeah, I think that's right. And you could think of it analogously as like, imagine a, sh- a chef who's like, oh, I just want to make something tasty. And that's... Uh, in some sense, a worthwhile goal, but some of the universal elements of tastiness, like saltiness, you could just talk about it being the right level of salty. Like choice is important and you could just talk about having choices. But otherwise, the range of palettes that exists is so wide that it seems to sort of be tilting at a windmill to like, no, 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 no. I want to make it fun. Like, sure, but for whom and in what way? And you're much more likely, paradoxically, to come up with something that is fun for someone if you focus on the constituents of what you think is a fun experience rather than trying to hit some like broad idea of fun when people have like very different tastes and palettes and games. Fun for the whole family means fun for none. (laughs) Yeah. That's related to what what I was just going to bring up is it seems like what we're talking about is a way of thinking about the genres of games. Because one way of thinking about the genres of movies is thinking about what kinds of reaction the movie is supposed to elicit from you and you might think of like fun is plausibly the genre like the reaction that you expect from the genre of like super broad adam sandler comedies that no one really enjoys but you know people can presumably usually sit through whereas horror games or games that are made to stress you out and hate your friends maybe a more sensible way of thinking about the genre a genre of games than say strategy role playing or like ideas of genre which focus on the mechanics when like those different mechanics can yield radically different emotional results yeah and so much of what is satisfying about a game is wrapped up in frustration too which is which feels like it's going to be antithetical to fun right like oh i'm going to sit here for 2 hours and do this really tedious task that i always joke that i'm like too much of a board gamer to play with normal people, but not enough of a board gamer to play with the board game people. Like I'm in this internal purgatory where I've worked my way out of the normal games, but I haven't quite made it all the way into the ones that um, my real board game friends play. But a lot of those are like, I mean, it can take an hour to set up the board and then you're spending three or four hours doing these 
teeny tiny, like, let me collect all of these gems and put them in this thing because eventually this thing is going to spin and I need to be on this track at this time. And like, if you described those things to somebody, they're like, that does not sound fun, right? That sounds like an algebra equation that I have to figure out for three hours, right? But the satisfaction of doing it and getting to see that progress and being able to, I think a lot for me, a lot of the satisfaction just comes from understanding it better than you did when you started. Like you work through that confusion and you're like, this is not making any sense. This is, I don't understand what's going on. And then at some point you're like, oh, I'm starting to understand. I can build a strategy. And so like being able to go from being dropped into a world that is completely foreign and you don't understand the rules of it and you don't understand what's happening to go to like, okay, I kind of get it to go to, okay, now I can make a plan and I can start to execute that plan. It just feels really rewarding. And even if the individual components of it aren't fun on their own. That's giving me Arkham Horror flashbacks, which is a game that seems to be designed entirely to make you confused for two thirds of it. And then exactly at the point that you start to feel like you can get a plan together, crush every hope that you have. I thought Terra Mystica, that's the fat game that I have that no one will play with me. (laughs) You know, very seldom. And I cheat in that I like bought the iPad version of it. So now like, because every like different race that you pick, it's one of these kind of basically risk sort of things, but just more elaborate and more different ways to get victory points and more economic stuff like Puerto Rico that you have to keep track of. Yeah, just like being able to play all the different races and their particular you know, the one thing that they can do special that you really have to base your whole strategy around, just do that in an online, you know, one player environment so that you have some idea going in. But then of course, nobody else that I would play with has done this, you know, comparable. So it always seems like the next game will be fun. If I can get you guys to play this again, you'll understand it and you'll be more on my level and then I won't just slaughter you. It always reminds me of this scene from Parks and Rec where Ben is trying to describe the cones of Dunshire to other people, right? And like, you can tell he's so passionate about it. He's like, no, you don't understand. There's all these interrelated pieces. So yeah. (laughs) So one thing that we're sort of dancing around here or talking about is like, is isomorphism, right? That you can build systems that are exactly equivalent to each other, but maybe we've just sort of slapped different skins on them, right? Like you can play the resistance with a copy of the Resistance Avalon. It's just a different theme and some people act that really matters to them. But especially with these more complicated games, one reason theme is important is because we use narrative to organize information as humans, right? We're like meaning making machines and all of these cardboard and chits that we're pushing around does not make any sense abstractly understood, but you need the narrative to organize it. This makes me think of studies of like chess grandmasters and their board memorization. So we know that one study found that chess grandmasters don't do any better than average people at memorizing a board position when the pieces are randomly placed, right? When it doesn't come out of an actual game. But a follow-up study to that found that when they do make mistakes, they tend to be mistakes that don't change the story on the board, right? So it's like this pawn over here on the king's side is out of place, but like the action's queen side, baby. So, right, like narrative as a way to organize information is something we really rely on. It, and it's how we're able to make sense of like Terra Mystica has a mathematically one billion pieces and they all mean something different. And the idea of it, like, you can imagine an alien race of accountants who are just like, what do you mean? Why? Because if I can get the yellows to that number, I'm superior. <laughs> like, and that's not mostly how we think about those games. Is that why point-based victories are always so unsatisfying because there's no narrative element to because if the strategy you've developed to play like a good a, you know a, a board game with any kind of decent depth has to be organized through if your strategy has to be organized in a narrative logical way and then the conclusion of it is a scoreboard is as non-narrative logical as you can get Maybe that's why I always hate score-based victory games. Maybe there are score-based victory games that you don't code that way because the score is properly narrativized in some way, right? Like, I think I agree with you. Like, why Settlers of Catan, point-based, why not just make it so that there's, like, an island council and you need to fill the seats on the council and that's how you accumulate the score? Is there is there something attractive about score-based victories that I just don't understand or, or am I just... To some people, right, we're back now to like, yeah, some people love number go up. And for them, that's fun. But you want there to be a story. Like the idea of like an island council that you have to fill is like a very good like hack 
of like, oh, this is a score that I've put a label on and that rules. Like Catan also is sort of, uh, Catan is like the Beatles of board games in that when you go back to it, you're like, when I went back to it, I was like, ah, oh, what's the big deal? But it's just because I'd played a bunch of board games by people who had played Catan. But the people who made Catan had never played Catan before, which is, I think, is amazing. I really like the point you make about how, like, if you can hide the score-based element inside of a larger narrative, it doesn't feel as, I guess, shallow, maybe. It's just like, why am I accumulating points? And I think there are some games that are really fascinating where, or maybe it's just because I, I can't mentally keep track of all these different score paths. So for me, there's some where I'm like, I don't really know what my score is until the end. Like, I still know that my score is what's going to determine if I win or not. Like, I'm thinking of like Isle of Cats. And there's a, a card game called Seasons where like there's all, so many different ways to score points and add things up that even though like you are doing it throughout, I usually don't know until like the very end if I'm like, oh, am I doing OK or not? But I'm still trying to reach those goals the whole way through. So even though it is the score that's going to ultimately decide if I won or not, it's goal based that isn't just tied up in the number. Like I'm I'm trying to accomplish something that is not just numerical in order to achieve that score eventually. Ticket to Ride is another good example of that because it is because you get you don't know how much you've got. And at the end of it, the scores get the score get counted up. But also interestingly in Ticket to Ride, the person who has the highest score is never the person who feels like they won. The person who feels like they won is the person who has the prettiest looking railway and has managed to pull off the most dick moves. <laughs> I think that really gets at an interesting point of like who gets to decide what a win counts as in a game, right? Like sometimes that's it's great that like I don't know, this person could say like, aha, I won and they got what they wanted, which was points the game. And other people at the table got what they wanted, which is like make trains pretty. And the fact that they didn't win is like, I don't know, I had the most fun. Does that mean I I lost? But that seems fine to me. In an early draft of Inhuman Conditions, which is a it's a two player interview that's modeled on but legally distinct from I'm required to say the Voigt Kampf test from the first five minutes of Blade Runner. In an early draft of that, we had a water gun on the table and it was really meant to simulate that feeling of like, please don't shoot me. Like being a little bit of wet is the worst amount of wet to be. And I am a human, but I'm still very nervous. And so I'm acting weird. And I was play testing it. And my friend Andrew picked up the water gun. He was the investigator and he just let me have it. I mean, truly soaked me like I'd squeegee my glasses level of wet. And I went, I'm a human. And he just with the shit eating his grin went like, I guess I lost. And obviously he didn't lose in that moment, right? <laughs> like, Let's do some more ads. This fall, as you get back into the swing of things, Bespoke Post is here with a new seasonal lineup of must-have Box of Awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods each month. So it's a subscription service with guy stuff. So you go to boxofawesome.com, you take a quiz to tell what kind of categories you're interested in. Could be clothing or gadgets, outdoor stuff, alcohol-related stuff. Based on that, they pick a box for you. You get charged $45, but each box has over $70 worth of gear in it. Like, for instance, there's a box this month called Stealth that has a cool utility knife, a utility pen, a Stealth money clip, a capsule that you can put cash and meds and other things in. Or there's another called Bullseye that's throwing knives and the stuff you need to use them. Or Play that has sex supplies. Or Rooted that's about potting your own little house plant. With each box of awesome, you're supporting small businesses. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small up-and-coming brand. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. Enter the code PRETTY at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com. Code PRETTY for 20% off your first box. If you're carrying a credit balance month after month, it can feel like you're in a never-ending cycle of debt. Upstart can help you make that final payment so you can get ahead. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high-interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score and is expanding access to affordable credit. Unlike other lenders, Upstart considers your income and current employment to find you a smarter rate for your loan. With a five-minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front for loans between $1,000 to $50,000, and you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. 
Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash pretty. That's upstart.com slash pretty. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash pretty. That makes me think of, I play Splendor and I play it on, on Board Game Arena. And the I think 21, like if you score 21, the game is over, right? Like that's that's the end. But I am such a like long-term player. Like I want to build up my strategy. So I lose almost always on Board Game Arena because most of the people that I'm paired up with there are, let me get to this number of points as quickly as possible. And I'm like, no, I want to build a strategy and collect these low-level cards so that I can eventually reach my goals in these high-level cards. And I, it was always so disappointing. But then I played with somebody else who played like me, and it was a much longer game. Like, it took us a lot longer, but we were both so much more satisfied by the time it took to, like, collect all of these things and reach all of these goals. And that's one where who you're playing with completely changes the gameplay and what experience you're going to get out of it. This is a thing that, for example, Magic the Gathering, and I, I know we're straying just a bit from board games, but like explicitly designs for, right, is styles of play where each color has its own style and then any combination of them also sort of reveals something about how someone likes to play games. The amount of effort and resources that have to go into designing a game like that and keeping it fresh is really amazing also. Keeping those color identities for over 20 years worth of additions is really a, a feat but yeah i was thinking exactly the same thing when you sit down to play magic as the you play, the first two three cards tell you exactly what kind of bad time you're going to have and that's just a really interesting feeling mm-hmm. and splendor is also just a card game i think i really don't the only difference between card games and board games is what 25 dollars <laughs> You know the fact, yeah. that, but it's it's basically the same experience. You know, it's just a matter of do you have the piece of cardboard in the middle or not? Yeah. So at the beginning of this conversation, I think we started with what ideologies can board games express? What do they express? And how should we think about the idea of systems that can often just be translated into other systems? Right? There are reskins of Puerto Rico that that don't call cubes slaves that are likely just as fun as Puerto Rico. I think one answer we're sort of pushing on here is the narrative that it tells helps inform how we organize the world. And I've definitely had the experience, not just of like thinking about points as, oh, I need a story here, but of like recognizing a thing that is covered by story and being like, oh, this is just points, right? Being able to move between those levels is really helpful in playing games. And I don't know, I think my point here is something like which levels we learn to move between can be informed by board games. Like, I don't want to make like a really deep point here about how like playing Puerto Rico makes you more likely to think that slavery economies are good ones. But insofar as those things can be like the water that we swim in, what stories we decide to tell with them, I think can be really important. I was in particular, like with Puerto Rico or any of those conquest games, even, you know, they renamed Settlers of Catan to Catan to take the settler element out of it. And even like terraforming Mars, which has been taken out of the realm of Earth and into a different planet where there ostensibly aren't natives to displace. It's still, it kind of gets a narrative in your head that there are these like pristine spaces waiting for humans to come and improve them with their, I guess, colonization of some form or another, right? To, to be able to bring their technology in and to be able to use the resources in some way. And so I think if there's a risk, because I, I agree with you, like, I don't think that playing Puerto Rico is going to make you more likely to go and become some sort of colonial overlord. But I do think that it just maybe heightens the narratives that that is an acceptable way to view our purpose as a species in a larger framework, right? Like that our purpose is go in, take these resources, turn them into something. And I mean, in some ways, maybe it is. But I think that these board games, by turning it into just a simple narrative mechanic, don't offer a lot of questioning of it, right? Don't offer a lot of why or purpose because it's just not, they're they're not designed to be deep enough to bring in a, you know, post-colonial lit text and give you, give you that. So what about just chess or something that it's, it's a war game that we're not questioning or the treatment of the pawns. Are there really pawns, you know, among individuals? Shouldn't, 
shouldn't all the pieces be equal in some way? I don't know. I haven't heard this specifically. Colonialism is such an egregious example that perhaps, you know, it deserves something more specific than like, yes, we should still have games like Risk or Chess or any number of total nuclear destruction games because that's just like a fundamental way of like, we're competing, one of us is going to win. And that should at least be one of the available types of games. I don't know that I would want to extend my ideological critique so far as to say, there just shouldn't be winners to games anymore. Like that's got to be an option. Here's a a different way of suggesting the ideological critique. So if we think about tropes in movies and in literature that we generally think of as like problematic and the way we think of them as problematic. So take like the damsel in distress thing. Right, where you have the like the movies that fail the Bechdel test. Like the problem with that is, is that like the women characters don't function as humans in the story. They function as like ob- objects which are there for disposable narrative purposes. And like the critique of movies like that is not that there shouldn't be trashy movies with silly heroines. It's that maybe we should be alive to the fact that this is an undercurrent in our pop culture. And I think the same thing applies to games, board games and video games as well. And I think that the genealogy of that is similar in both cases too, because in in the case of movies and literature, it's just like the easiest. So think of death, the Death Wish movies, right? We need a motivation for this guy to go on a killing spree. So obviously someone has been sexually assaulted and murdered because why, why wouldn't that be a good like motivation for someone to go on a killing spree? Similarly, like we know we have a board, we have a board game for think of chess. We have a board game and. The narrative mechanics, which we have kind of got to grips with, involve spreading pieces over a board. So why not express that as like war or as a battle? And then you can go deeper than that. And you think, okay, all a game requires is, I mean, you can argue whether a game even requires a win condition. It probably doesn't. But if a game does require a win condition, then what you need is some kind of normative framework to lay over that, to point the direction towards a win condition. And the easiest uh, normative frameworks that we can reach for are the ones which are most salient to us in our like political realities. So like getting more of something, that's a way to win. Or getting bigger is a way to win. So our games are about growing things and getting more and getting bigger. But there's no reason why, a priori, there's no reason why that has to be the case. And there's a really good analogy there with video games i think which is in the in the early days of video games point and shoot was just mechanically the easiest like what you needed to do was figure out a way to make a game of pointing a cursor somewhere and clicking a button and the obvious thing to come up with is just put a monster there and then make it die there's no reason why the thing that that represents has to be a gun it's just the habit that we fell into and so maybe making the ideological criticism of like okay these games glorify violence It shouldn't be to say there shouldn't be any stupid, fun, violent games, but to just maybe be alive to the fact that these ways of skinning these mechanics do express particular political ideologies. And then whether how how far that's a problem is a different. Yeah, that was a really absolutely. I completely agree with that. And I absolutely I think it's really hard for games, especially board games. Like I think video games have more freedom with this now, especially with the technological advancements. But I think of board games that do try to put a really complex story in, and I'm like, oh, well, you just give me the rules already, right? Like, I don't need three pages of narrative. Like, I don't, okay, I don't need all my characters' names and motivations. Just, like, tell me where to put the pieces so I can start playing. And so I think that there's a barrier to, to making those things more complex because most of the time, if you're sitting down to play a board game, the average board game player is not there for that kind of in-depth story and it's a lot easier to just say, okay, you're already familiar with this theme here. Slap it on. We can we can run with it. And so I think that the barrier to get over it is harder, not just because it's more work for the creator, but also because the audience is more resistant to it. This is making me think of, you know, the old analogy about a, a conversation in a room that people keep leaving and re-entering. And it's the same conversation, even if all the participants change. I, I'm thinking about photosynthesis, which is a board game where you're just placing trees and you're trying to get you're trying to get that sweet, sweet light and you will cast shade on other players' trees. And it's like a really beautiful, we call it tree fight internally. Like on the one hand, it's about just growing trees and there's no war. On the other hand, you are still trying to get the most of a thing because there's still this sort of underlying evolutionary metaphor. And that game 
maybe forms the basis for games that will come after it that will be able to complicate the story in the way that Michelle you're describing, but like that game can't exist until photosynthesis first exists. Like we need that context in order to do anything else. I want to like circle back on chess because a, a thing that Al said, like I totally agree. Like, and I think that's one of the most important things that's been said so far is like being alive to those facts and what kinds of stories are available to us that we think of, that we reach for, that are easy to hand. That's all really important. And again, you can imagine playing Puerto Rico in a, an educational context as a way of saying like, and what did we learn about totally amoral approaches to economics? And why is it that corporations are so rapaciously extractive or something? Is it because those of you who cared about having slaves did worse than those of you who are like, yeah, give me those cubes, right? That would be like a very, like a really good way to illustrate using just the game Puerto Rico, the ways that if you're willing to sacrifice moral questions, like you can do great. So like those games being available also help us question their own narrative. So yeah, the point is not we should get rid of chess because it's a war narrative, but is there any game that we are more thoroughly steeped in a context of than chess, right? Like chess has the context that Puerto Rico doesn't, just in the sense of like, we talk about being treated as pawns as a really bad, as a, a, a sort of an insult. And also people have taken, ch like chess is not just the game we all know on a 64 square checkerboard, right? Chess is, there are also chess puzzles. Some of them are helpmates where you have to play cooperatively with the other player, right? There are like fantasy versions of chess. You can tell jokes with chess. Like chess is almost a language in and of itself and we can do as much as we can with it is a sign that if a game gets far enough into the culture, we start remixing it. You guys have made me reevaluate. I bet in Catan that the thief was not the thief originally because story-wise, oh, we're all going to go to this land. It's the indigenous nomadic tribe that is wandering around and you got to get your army, push them out, make them go somewhere else. Like the fact that that was at some point sanitized. I This is an entirely unfounded allegation i think initially it may have been a barbarian there you go maybe can we close down here by sort of just going around and giving a recommendation for a you know really conceptually interesting board game that hasn't yet come up or a disrecommend just give us a little anecdote from your your history here michelle do you want to start us well, I guess if you just want an anecdote, I would say that the best game that I have played recently has been, and it is one of those pandemic legacy games, but season zero of pandemic legacy is set in like the 1950s Cold War and your spies. And it is a really interesting and compelling narrative that doesn't feel like it's hitting you over the head with it to get started. Like it reveals it as you're going. And the gameplay of that legacy game is really intricate so that if you're playing with a group of friends or you're playing with your spouse or partner, it's going to be a lot of, I will say fun, but I also just think complexity that is rewarding. That's awesome. Season Zero is the one I haven't played and it's very exciting to hear that's the one you're, that rules. I want to recommend Spirit Island, which is a settler destruction game. It's a cooperative game where you play the spirits of an island that are coming to life as colonialists arrive and your job is to work with the people of the island to repel them. And it does a really amazing job of troubling some of these exact narratives that we're talking about and of accommodating lots of different play styles. Each spirit has a different play style and they have a very good explanation of like, if you like this kind of play, then this is your play. And this is a high complexity spirit. If you like fiddling with chits, oh boy, get ready. Spirit Island is one of my all-time favorite games. It's very good. Al, do you have something for us? Yeah, I'm going to recommend, I haven't played for a few years, but it sticks out in my mind as an all-time favorite, uh, Escape from the Dark Castle, which is a dungeon crawling role-playing game, which is which can be played solo, but is best played with other people. And it's basically, if you enjoy Dark Souls, you will enjoy this board game because you never win. But the way, every way, I love a game that makes you lose in interesting ways, especially with friends. And that is an excellent example of the genre, especially if you like gross, gaudy horror artwork. I want to bring up, just because it hasn't come up yet today, Wingspan. I understand it entered my family. I don't remember who gave it to who and has apparently become a giant hit in the industry. Just ridiculously good sort of art and like 
I just want to sit and look at the cards and read about birds. Like the the fact that you have that kind of, I won't say entirely peaceful because you can like, oh, you got a a meat eating bird, (laughs) tuck other cards under it. (laughs) So there's a little bit of brutality there, but for the most part, but I, I just, I've learned the hard way in dealing with a large extended family with more, you know, variety of ages and some more game oriented than others is were I to do it again, I would practice how to explain the game to people because Wingspan is the kind of game that like, like, okay, there's, there's technically a lot of options, but it's nowhere near Terra Mystica. It's basically pretty simple as these things go. And as long as you feel really confident and can explain so quickly without having to read slowly through the instructions out loud to a group of people, then they'll buy it and they'll play it and they'll have fun. And not be like, oh, are there victory points? Hell with this. <laughs> Recent editions of Wingspan ship with like, if this is your first time, play one of these players. Here are your first two turns laid out and why you're making those moves. But it's a real issue of like, how do you explain a system that once it clicks will be totally fine, but you have to get someone to hold the watch gears in their mind until you can place that last one. That is similar. I tried to play Spirit Island, but I tried to play it just me and my spouse with nobody who had played it before. And we opened up the rule book and we're going through and we were like, I don't, I can't hold what I just read in my mind long enough to also put this in my mind. I'm like, we just need to play the four of us with two people who have already played so that they can sit there and tell us, now you do this, now you do that. And I think that's a, a barrier to people getting involved in it. But it also gives us kind of a responsibility as game players to spread the word of like, hey, this is a good game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you how to do it. I'll, I'll get on a Zoom with you and your husband and teach you Spirit Island. I'd love to do that. I love teaching that game. Yeah, it, it looks fantastic. We were just very overwhelmed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I got you. All right, well, let's make a date for a four-person uh, plus online game coming out of this. Uh, thank you all for, for coming on. I hardly had to talk at all. This is great. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. All right, so long, uh, listeners. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. You can also now get all the bonus content directly through Apple Podcasts by signing up for a paid subscription there, which gets you ad-free episodes and extra talking not only for Pretty Much Pop, but also for my other podcasts, Nakedly Examined Music and Philosophy vs. Improv. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life Podcast Network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.